Look at page one. Let's see how we, quickly we can move. A quick overview. It, I love charts, and this doesn't communicate a whole lot, but it reminds us of things that seem like a long time ago. The seven churches, the, vis, the open door, chapters four to five, is that's when John said there was an open door in heaven, and he looked through the door into that other world. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the cosmic war, good versus evil, the dragon and the woman and the baby, the dragon that wanted to eat the baby, the fall of ba the seven last plagues, the fall of Babylon, the last judgment, the millennium, then the new heaven and the new earth. And tonight we're doing the epilogue. When we look at that chart, there's a recurrence of contrast in the book of Revelation. If we had time, we could talk about each of these, but a contrast between good and evil, between God and Satan, between Christ and Antichrist, and even his name. There's the Christ and there's the Antichrist. There's the lamb and the dragon. There's Jerusalem, Babylon, the bride and the great prostitute, salvation, damnation. And um, can you think of any other contrasts? There's a, there's a bunch of them. And like June says, the good guys win. The good guys win. And of those, of those contrasts, good, God, Christ, Lamb, Jerusalem, Bride, Salvation, that's what we end with. The building double crescendo that climaxes, in other words, as you read through the book of Revelation, you're building to a crescendo and it's a double crescendo in terrifying judgment for the citizens of Babylon and glorious salvation for the citizens of Jerusalem. So you've got this twofold climax. And three, Revelation is not a crystal ball to enable us to discern the future, although we can learn some things, but it's rather a clarion final call to make a decision. It really is a gospel sermon. Which city do you belong to? Which Lord will you serve, Christ or Antichrist? The lamb or the dragon? Are you a citizen of Babylon or Jerusalem? So make a decision. For those who open the door and let Jesus come in as Lord and King, remember Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. For those who let him in, Revelation encourages us to, and I just, these are sort of summary words. One, to look up. Our king has not forgotten us. He knows our trials and persecutions. He watches every tear that falls, and he's coming back. We are saved in hope, so lift up your heads. Redemption draws near. It might be before sundown tonight. Keep watching. Keep your heads up. You don't have to go through life with your head down. Two, look in. Because no one knows the day of his return, we must live in constant readiness. Prepare to meet your God. What if it were today? So look inside. Am I ready? Reflect. What if he did come before Sundown, would I say, oh, it's wonderful? Or would I say, oh, my goodness, I know, I'm not ready? We're supposed to live with that constant readiness. Three, watch out. There are many enemies that threaten to destroy us and rob us of our salvation. The world, the flesh, and the devil are all around us. Therefore, be careful and walk in obedience. Be faithful even unto death. So watch out. And then number four, look around. So look up, look in, watch out, look around. That's a good four-point sermon. Look around meaning there are many opportunities to serve our Lord and to be his witnesses. And the Greek word for witness is martyr. There's many opportunities for you to lay down your life for Jesus. Does that make you... Joyful or 
sober or sort of both at the same time. It's like, I think I, well, if I live in the evil empire and they're throwing followers of Jesus to the lions and burning them at the stake, it's like, I get it. That's what you mean. But there are hungry people, people looking for the truth in the last days. Others need to have the opportunity to flee from the coming wrath and find salvation in the city of God. The last days will be the greatest days of world evangelization the world has ever known. So look around. There, and I don't know if I've ever been more aware of hungry people, people that are hungry because they're confused and they're not finding food. That doesn't mean they're ready to eat if you offer them something. But there's a lot of hunger out there, and a lot of people say, all my options are bankrupt. And frankly, it's pretty obvious they are. Okay? That's all introduction. Any other comments on introduction? So tonight, we're going to look at uh, Revelation 22, 6, 6 to 21, which are if we want to say it this way, God's last words. So I got to thinking about famous last words. If you Google this stuff, there's all kinds of stuff, and this is really interesting. It's, some of it's amusing, some of it's you know, just tragic, and some of it's very inspiring. But when someone is about to leave, especially when one is nearing death, their final words usually reveal that which they are thinking most deeply about. And here's just a, this is my random list. You can develop your own list. Bing Cosby, Crosby, that was a great game of golf, fellers. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, this, will, this is cynical. I should have switched from scotch to martinis. And he slips into eternity. Oscar Wilde, the playwright, said, either this wallpaper goes or I do. <laughs> That's, that's not funny, but it's, it's tragic. I, and this Dominique fellow was a French grammarian. I first heard this actually in the French language. Je meurs ou je me meurs. It's a, but he, supposedly he was dying and said in French, but I'm about to, or is it I'm going to, either expression is used, <laughs> and he died. He's a grammarian. I, what do you do with that? Here's some good ones. Here, these are much. All this is leading to what would God say? What are his last words? Not that God is dying, but that when God is wrapping up what he's had to say, Nathan Hale, you know this one, before he was hung as a spy, captured, he was a patriot. I only regret that I had but one life to give my country. It's like, wow. Or uh, Lord Nelson, at the Battle of Trafalgar, he was mortally wounded, and as he was dying on his ship, he said, thank God, I've done my duty. That's just so majestic. You know, it's, a, now it's not Christian necessarily, but it's, it's, a, it's something bigger than himself. Or Thomas Jefferson, and a politically, I certainly don't always agree with him, but his, he died on the 4th of July, the 50th anniversary of the 4th of July, 1776, and supposedly his dying words were, is it the 4th? <laughs> That's so beautiful. Uh, Socrates, this is interesting. Crito, I owe a rooster to Asclepius. Will you remember to pay my debt? <laughs> That's, I don't know. Uh, and John Wesley, you all know this one. The best of all, God is with us. And I even added to the list, just as I was thinking, I said, what were Jesus' last words? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's real interesting to think about last words. But the point, Revelation 22 gives a record of God's final words to us. It would be misleading to think of the, that these words are more important than other words God has spoken. But these are apparently the words that he wants us to remember. It's like, as you close my book, as you read the last page, I want to say some things that I just want them to ring in your ears, and we're going to try to 
hear those tonight. So what I'm going to do is Roman numeral 3 is the next to the last word, and Roman numeral 4 is the last word. So don't peek yet at what the last word is, but uh, we're going to get there. Somebody's already peeking. But, uh, yeah. So when a chapter, when the chapter is finished, there's nothing, when this chapter, chapter 22 is finished, there's nothing more to say. All has been said more definitive than when a judge pounds his gavel. I thought of you, Tim, when I wrote that. These words complete what God wants us to understand. There's nothing more to say. So just picture God, boom, when he gets to the end of this chapter. Can I, can I read it? Let's, let me read it for you. I've got the English Standard Version, and I'm going to read the whole thing, make a few comments, and then we're going to add the last word to what was said. I'm starting at verse 6. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits and of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Remember that. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and the prophets and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Don't worship the messenger. Worship the one who sent the messenger. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. Behold, second time he says it, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What? <laughs> That's all right. That, I kept thinking I was, I heard the trumpets, though. Uh, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers the sexually immoral and murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. That's the third time he said it. <coughs> Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Or amen. <laughs> okay. Let's try to... Uh, summarize this. I was, um, I actually preached this on Easter Sunday morning. I think it was 2008. It was, uh, 
it was just, we were preaching through Revelation and it ended up at Easter and it was on the last chapter of the Bible. So I pulled out some of my notes and I looked at what I said. And it was roughly this, but more or less. The next to the last word. So what is in this chapter? A, it begins with a word of affirmation to authenticate all that has been said when the angel says, these words are trustworthy and true. If somebody's telling you something that's really hard to believe, if it's a person you respect and they look you in the eye and they say, this is really true, I'm not making this up. You know, this is trustworthy. And that's what I think the Spirit is saying to John. This, all 22 chapters, this is true, this is coming. The two cities, the wedding. There really is going to be a wedding. There really is a city that's about to come down. These words are trustworthy and true. So there's a word of affirmation. God wants us to close the book with that ring of it's true, it's true, it's true. Because if you're like me, sometimes you get caught up in life and it feels sort of like a fairy tale. That, Lord, is it really true? Can I really believe it's true, it's true. B, a word of promise to give us hope. Three times, 7, 12, and 20, Jesus says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. I am coming soon. And it's almost as if, as you close the book, yeah, I got it, Lord, I got it. Soon, you're coming. Jesus is coming. For the believer... The promise of Christ's return tomorrow makes it possible to live in victory today. In other words, we're saved in hope. And the hope that is coming is meant to change my today. I can face the trials, the tribulations, the disappointments, the persecution today, Pastor John says, because tomorrow the heavens are going to open and a white horse is going to appear. Regardless of how bad things are now, we can survive and even thrive because of the certainty of His return and His coming glorious kingdom. I just, I've just learned of this story. This is a good story. I didn't know this. I'm going to, I'm going to read it. Just. On July the 4th, 1952, a lady named Florence Chadwick tried to swim from Catalina Island to the coast of Florida, California. Uh, Florida, that would be... <laughs> she wanted to be the first woman to complete the 21-mile swim, but the fog was so thick she could barely even see the boats traveling with her. Finally, after almost 16 hours in the water, she quit. Getting into one of the boats, she discovered she was only half a mile from shore. <laughs> In a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Isn't that good? And uh, there's, the devil's going to put up fog. He's going to keep the city and the kingdom and the king. He's going to do his best to make you think it's not there or it's so far that you can't just quit, just give up. And so keep your eyes on the shore. Keep your eyes on the shore. It's closer than you think. I, uh, I really like that. I really like that. Number two on this, the word, a word of promise. But how can the return of Jesus Christ be soon when we've been waiting for 2,000 years? Even in the first century, and you can be sure you're not the first person to ask that question. They ask that before Paul was dead. <laughs> I said, Paul, where is he? I thought it was going to be soon. So even in the New Testament, and the most important paragraph in the New Testament that answers this question is in 2 Peter 3. And let me just read it with you. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, Where's the promise of His coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Where's this Jesus fella? 
Who said he's coming back? But do, you, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is, anybody know the word? Patient. But is patient. The King James says, but is forbearing. Any other translations? Did I hear a word? That... Long-suffering, yes. And the word is a very interesting word. I, I know just enough Greek to get me in trouble. Macro thumeo or th thumia. Thumia means passion. I've put the note there, or and even anger. And macro means big. So it's tra often translated long suffering. God is has very big capacity to contain his passion because his justice would say he ought to burn up the earth. But God is patient. He's long suffering. He's not slow. He's not slow. Don't mock his slowness. He's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach, what's the word? Repentance. Not just salvation. He's waiting for us to repent and the world to repent. He doesn't want to bring the judgment. He wants people to repent. God wants to save. He's long-suffering. So there's a word, his next to the last word in this chapter. There's a word of affirmation, it's true. There's a word of promise, he's coming soon. C, top of page three, there's a twofold word of blessing to motivate us to obedience. There are seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation, and in your footnote, I gave you where to find them. We looked at them on the first day we met. I doubt you remember that. I had to go back and look it up myself. There are seven be where it says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, seven times in Revelation, two of which are in this passage. And here they are. Verse 7, blessed is the one who keeps the words. Not just who hears the words, not just the one who believes the words, not just the one who likes to go to Bible studies where you talk about the words, but blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. This book is not just given so we will have more information about the last days. It is given to us so that we will do what it says. And I tried to write down a few phrases of what it tells us to do, but believe the gospel, Hope in Christ's return, love your neighbor, bear witness to Jesus, obey our Lord, follow his commands, resist temptation, stand fast in tribulation, be faithful unto death, keep your doctrine pure. Those are just some of the things we're told in the book of Revelation. Do what it says. Blessed is the one who keeps the words. And number two, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life that they may enter the city. Now this is interesting. The verb wash, blessed are those who wash their robes, the verb wash is in the present tense referring to a continual ongoing washing. So in other words, blessed are those who keep on washing and keep on washing their robes because our garments tend to get dirty again. Now that's interesting. And a lot of people love that theology. They say, oh, that means we're just all messed up and we're all sinful until the very end. But thank God that he loves us and saves us anyway. But if you'll go back, uh, yeah, once is not enough. However, in Revelation 7.14, 
it says that our robes must be washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Here, in 714, both verbs, if you know your Greek, which most of us don't, but is in the arrowist tense, not the present tense, but signifying an action that is once for all. So are you, do you hear what I'm saying? In other words, one, on one time, seven, in 714, the scripture says you need to wash your robes once for all. I mean, there's a once for all dealing with sin that God wants to do to make you clean where you're clean. Another place in Revelation, it says you need to keep on washing your robes because they need a continual. And I want to say, which one is it? Which one is it? Because it, this is a huge theological point and basically goes to the core of the difference between Calvinists and Arminians and Wesleyans. It really does. Can we be free from sin or do we live with sin from here on out? And frankly, I think the book of Revelation says, yes. <laughs> They're both true. And I don't know if I like that, but I do think that's what the Bible says. And not just here, but in a lot of places, the Bible uses this kind of language. Uh, one, and I, one of the commentators referenced this. One is reminded of Jesus' word to Peter. Remember when Jesus was washing feet? And Peter said, no, Lord, Messiahs don't do feet. You're not going to wash my feet. And then Jesus said this. The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. But he's completely clean. It's like, Lord, what are you saying? Do I need to wash? Well, my feet, they're dirty, yeah. But I, 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 I really like this. And if you know your theology and some of the arguments of how much freedom can we really expect from sin in this life, these kind of verses speak to it. Where we keep on washing our robes, and yet we're also told to wash our robes once and for all. Any comments on that? And if you're looking for neat and concise answers on that, I try not to be neat and concise where I don't think the scriptures are neat and concise and they speak in, in, a, in a full sort of way. Alan, yeah. It does, absolutely. So, but and what's the next verse? I like very much what you're saying. I think, I think that's how Scripture comes at this. It says things clearly. I don't mean it's foggy, but, it's, but it says it in a very dynamic way. That, that expresses the ongoing nature of how we live. I mean, I know I wrestle with sin. I can't deny the fact that. I've prayed for cleansing. I trust that I am. But I know its presence. Sin remains, but it does not reign, is one of the cliches that some preachers have used that stick with me. That's sort of helpful. Um, Okay. That helpful? Um, I didn't put this in your notes, but uh, how, do we, how do we wash our robes? It's not a dry cleaning service. <laughs> you wash them in blood. We talked about this several weeks ago. It's, you need liquid, but to make your robes white, they need to be washed in crimson blood. Interesting chemistry there. Okay? Let's talk about D. We're talking about the next to the last word. There's a command, a word of command, to help us keep the main thing the main thing. And the main command is this little two-word 
command, worship God. And uh, back in chapter 19, you've got the reference there, verses 9 and 10, John had made this same mistake where the angel comes with the message and John worships the angel. <laughs> and the angel says, don't do that. Worship God. Don't worship the messenger. This is the second time God, John, has worshipped the messenger rather than the one who sent the message. If the mailman delivers you a love letter, don't fall in love with the mailman. <laughs> and I love the fact that that's on the last page of the Bible because we fall into this trap over and over and over. We like the messenger. And we get so caught up in whether it's Wesley or whether it's a pastor or whether it's grandma, and we tend to interpret God through that messenger and even worship the vehicle. And God says, don't do that. Don't do that. The messenger will let you down. Don't fall in love with the mailman. <laughs> I like that. Fall in love with God. Worship him. But it's on the last page of the Bible, so I think it's something God knows we have a tendency to do. This is not a suggestion to worship God. It's a command, and it summarizes the message of the whole book. If the study of Revelation does not culminate in worship, now let me give you some big words. If eschatology does not result in doxology, now if you want to say that in seminary someday, that'll impress your friends, but it's a good way to say it. Eschatology is the doctrine of last things. Doxology is worship. If studying last things doesn't cause us to fall on our face and worship God, then, how did I say it? We've misunderstood the message and missed the whole point. And the angel says, worship God. Don't get sidetracked. Okay? Are we all together? Any comments? I'm, I'm... E, another... Next to the last word, a fourfold word of warning to put the fear of God in us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not a bad thing. Not all fear is neurotic. Some fear is very healthy. <coughs> and here's at least four warnings in these last 20 verses. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. What does that mean? What an interesting way to say it. This is what I think the warning is. The day is coming soon when change will be impossible when the day of grace will be ended and destinies are fixed forever. There will be no chance for last-minute repentance. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow will be too late. I think that's the warning. I know that's the warning. Uh, two other just warnings just to mention. I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he's done. We've talked about the judgment earlier. Number three, outside the city are the dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Just a reminder that not everyone is in the city. But especially this warning, number four, uh, and because it's so explicit. I warn everyone, and we're almost at the end of the book, and this is the warning. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, in other words, if you make God say more than God said, if you add to the word of God, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. 
And if you're a preacher of the gospel, you better swallow hard and say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. In other words, God's word is everything we need to know. Don't add to it. Don't take from it. And let me just give you some illustrations. Warning, don't tamper or distort God's book. Don't add to it, and I'm going to name some names here, but the Mormons, your Mormon friends, and they're good people, wonderful people, wonderful people. But they've got, they always tell you, I love the Bible. I believe the Bible. It's the Word of God. They might even say it's inerrant. I'm assuming they do. But then if you listen, they'll say, but we've got, you see, another book called the Book of Mormon. And it completes the revelation. I think that's exactly what the warning is speaking to. The Muslims, they will tell you, we believe the Angel, the Gospel, the Torah, those are part of our holy books. I don't know Islam real well, but they talk about holy books. And the Bible is part of that. They'll say, we believe that, but we don't really read those because we believe they've been corrupted. But thank God, thank Allah, Muhammad gave us the Quran. We have added to the revelation. And all this stuff in recent years on the Gnostic Gospels, you know, the Da Vinci Code kind of stuff, and the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, I mean, this was all in National Geographic and people kinds of saying, we've got a new gospel, we've got a new gospel. That's what he's talking about. Don't add to and don't take from it. Do you remember Thomas Jefferson's Bible? <laughs> he cut out the parts literally with scissors. I've seen it at Monticello. Monticello. He, he, the parts he didn't think that didn't fit his theology... He just took scissors and cut it out. I actually, I bought a copy of it at Barnes & Noble. They've got Jefferson's Bible. I, this, I shouldn't tell you all these things. But I, on Easter Sunday morning, I stood up and I told Loudonville Church, I'm going to read from the gospel from the Jefferson Bible. And everybody looked at me like, what, what are you doing? And you read, about the resur you read about the crucifixion, and it goes, and they laid him in a tomb, and they sealed the tomb... Thus ends the reading, you know, because Jefferson couldn't believe in the resurrection. I said, I, and I said on, Sunday, on Easter Sunday, you'll be glad to know I have another copy of the Bible that's got the full text. Jefferson took out what didn't fit his theology. Or higher criticism, for lack of a better word, which tends to train people in seminary to think not all of the word is inspired, and you can sort of pick and choose the parts that don't agree, I'm being, I'm saying it too cavalierly, but that's what it is. It's the idea that we can pick and choose. And the warning in the next to the last paragraph of the book, God says, don't mess with my word. I've told you what I wanted to tell you. Don't take, don't add. Somebody was going to say something. I was reflecting on Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. But I understood yeah, he, he couldn't handle the miracles. Yeah, yeah. I forget, but that was the heart of it. It didn't fit into his deistic understanding of God. But he loved the Sermon on the Mount. Mahatma Gandhi loved the Sermon on the Mount. But as soon as you start to say, I can pick and choose, you're doing what the warning is against. And this is at work big time in the gay marriage debate where pe people pick and choose or find ways. Yeah, and I just remember the, um, what more can he say than to you he has said? Such a great line. What more can he say? He said it. Okay. And we're almost at the end. There's F. We're talking about 
Do you know the word penultimate and ultimate? Mm -hmm. uh, but penultimate is next to the last. Ultimate is last. But there's a, finally a twofold invitation to reassure us of God's infinite grace. And uh, this really blessed me because when, when I began to see this. The spirit and the bride say, that's an invitation. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who's thirsty, come. And let the one who desires, take. The water of life without price. It's an invitation. Come, come. And right at the end of the book, the door is open. The day of grace is here. Come, come, drink. If you're thirsty, there's living water. Drink. The invitation is given by the Holy Spirit and the church, which is the bride, to the unbelieving world around us. Come to the waters, all who are thirsty, come. And I just wrote here, American evangelicals did not invent the altar call. Uh, the altar call is, of course, where at the close of a service, nearly all of us grew up in this environment where you hear the evangelist say, come, come on down, get out of your pew and come. Well, you know, whether people physically move or not, I'm not going to argue and, or where that is. That's not the point of what I'm trying to make here. The point is there's an invitation to come because you don't get in the kingdom without hearing the invitation and responding to it. American evangelicals did not invent that. I've heard, and I say that because I've heard people say that. Oh, that invitation stuff that Billy Graham does, that's just an American aberration. Well, Billy Graham's American and the Cam Crusades and all that, there may be some piece of truth. But don't tell me that when Billy Graham says, I want you to move, I want you to respond, Jesus is here speaking, and if you hear his voice, come, come. Don't blame that on American culture. Blame that on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, uh, that's at the heart of it. And it's on the last page. Every true gospel service ends in an invitation. Yeah, I just have this quote. I thought it was so good from one of the commentaries I've been using. It is the testimony of the church empowered by the Holy Spirit that constitutes the great evangelizing force of this age. It's that, this is the role of the bride, to just go out into the highways and by and say, come, there's a wedding, there's a wedding going to happen, and you're invited. But there's another invitation, very different. Come, Lord Jesus, verse 20. In verse 17, the invitation was that the world would come to Christ but in verse 20, the invitation is that Christ would come to the world. Isn't that good? I mean, that's, it's like there's two invitations. One is, as the people of God, we say to the lost, come. The other invitation is, as we, as the people of God, say to Jesus, come, come, come Lord Jesus. This is one of the earliest prayers of the church. Come, Lord Jesus. We have its original expression in 1 Corinthians 16.22. Some of you may want to look that up. Anybody know what the word is there? Maranatha. Is that Greek or Hebrew? Or what? Wrong. This is the trick question. I, don't, when I ask a quick trick question, I'll embarrass you if you try to answer. It's not Greek. It's not Hebrew. It's Aramaic. There's very few Aramaic words in the New Testament. But Aramaic, like in the movie The Passion, they spoke Aramaic. That was the language people spoke. They wrote in Greek, or they read in Hebrew. <laughs> they were pretty bright, but they spoke Aramaic. There's a, anybody know, what are some other Aramaic words in the New Testament? Anybody remember? Abba is a big one. Abba, that's Aramaic. Uh, Talitha kumi. Remember when Jesus was healing the little girl and he said, Talitha kumi? It's, and it says, you don't remember that? I'm getting blank looks. Uh, but it's like saying, sweetheart, get up. Sweetheart, get up. 
It's so, and I think when the, uh, the apostles heard it, they said, we don't want to translate that into Greek. Because when Jesus said, sweetheart, get up, you know, it was just so incredibly beautiful. And Abba, when Jesus would pray, he would say, Abba. Let's don't translate that. Let's just keep the Aramaic. And when the early church would pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. They're throwing us to the lions here. Or, they're eating us alive. Come. They would say, they would pray, Maranatha, Maranatha. M-A-R is the word for Lord, and I don't know Aramaic, but I know the root Mar. If you're from India, the Mar Toma Church, the, the Lord Thomas Church, St. Thomas. It's uh, the same root from Syriac and Aramaic, but Mar, Anatha, Lord, come, come, come. That's Alan. I, I think you're right. Is, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. And uh, it's a very interesting study. There's, there's only a handful of Aramaic terms, but usually it reflects very tender, sort of intimate things like sweetheart or like uh, Abba, father or Maranatha, come Lord, come Lord. And the writers of the New Testament just said, we don't want to translate that. And when we get to the last word, we're going to see another word that is so beautiful, it's like, we're not going to translate that one. We're just going to let that sit forever. Um, it almost seems that God is giving the last word to us. Having finished what he had said, God points to us and says, in so many words, okay, I'm done. The last word belongs to you. If you don't know what to say, I'll give you a hint. Say this, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> I think he's telling us, say, that's okay. If you say, Lord, I don't know what to pray. Pray this, Maranatha, come Lord, come Lord. Just pray that, never stop praying it. But I can only prompt you, you're going to have to say it for yourself. So it's almost as if he says, you've got the last word, or the next to the last word. <laughs> it's right at the end of the chapter. Come, Lord Jesus. Okay? Are you, we got five minutes. I'm going to give you the last word. And you know what it is. You've been looking ahead. I know. But wait. There is one final word. Now, I am skipping a very important word, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And we could spend a lot of time on grace. So I'm, but I want you to know I'm mindful of what I'm doing. I'm moving to the last word, the last, last word. All previous words have been penultimate next to the last. This word is the ultimate and final word for all people in all times everywhere. When this word is said, there is nothing else to say unless you want to repeat the same word again. What's the word? Amen. Amen. And if you don't have anything to say, I can top that. Just say, say it again. Amen. 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 And just, you're getting warmed up like the old Negro spiritual. Amen. It's only got one word in the whole song. I mean, they do add, add verses, but it's just, they got it. They got the point. That's the word. Amen. Amen is transliterated, which means you take a foreign word and you just bring it into your language. Like the word rendezvous. That's not an English word, that's a French word. But we've transliterated it. We've made it English, but it, we all sort of know, well, it's not really English, but it is now. Okay, well, so with amen. It's a Hebrew word and it's translated into both Greek, so in other words, if you read your Greek New Testament, you'll read in the Greek language the sound, Amen. Just like we do in English, and I think just like we do in every other language. We got a lot of languages in this word. Does the word Amen exist in all the languages that you know? Can any? It's like the word Hallelujah. It's just like, it's... Um, it comes from a root that means firm, dependable, secure, and certain. 
Jesus used the word often, beginning many statements, and I still remember in seminary when, somebody, when I understood this, when Jesus would say, verily, verily, I say unto you, what he said in the Greek is, amen, amen, I say to you. I said, you're kidding. That's what he said, amen, amen. In other words, certain, certain. This is it. And he's quoting Hebrew. And, no, and to my knowledge, no one else in history introduced their words like that. That was a Jesusism. He just said, this is, but when he puts the amen, amen there, you know it's true. Uh, this was Jesus' way of guaranteeing that his words were reliable and true. When God says amen, and if you go through and study this in Scripture, there's times when God says amen. It means it shall be so. It is through Jesus that all the promises and purposes of God are established. This is why Jesus is the great amen of God. Jesus is called in Revelation 3.14, the Amen. What an interesting title. It's like, He is the Amen. He's certain. He's the final. He's the ultimate. And 2 Corinthians 1 is such a beautiful verse. In Him, it is always yes. Now the word there is yes, but it's the same idea as Amen. It's always yes in Jesus. All the promises of God find their yes in him. And in the English Standard Version, it capitalizes the word yes, Y-E-S, capital Y-E-S. Jesus is the yes from God. He's the amen from God. It is through, that is why it is through him we say amen. That's what they're saying. We say amen because of Jesus. He is the amen. He's the yes. But when worshipers say amen, it means, yes, let it be so, I agree, I identify with all that has been said. Once you've said amen, there's nothing else to say, as I said before, unless you want to say it again. <laughs> Just say it again. That's okay. Uh, the best you can do is repeat it. It means, let the Lord have his way. And I just wrote, imagine if the whole creation were saying, Amen. Let the Lord have his way. Let the Lord, and that's the kingdom, where there's just one great, let it be so. Let it be so. Let the Lord have his way. Does anybody know, Mike, you put me onto this. You got me, you reminded who the, the preacher S.M. Lockridge is. Mike and Rosita do. Nobody else? Oh. oh, Tim does. How do you know him? Or, I've heard Mike Daniel many times. Yeah, it is. Uh, if, 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 if you've heard it once, it's unforgettable. And I'm not going to try it because I can't. You, you need to be black, frankly. S.M. Lockridge, he's been dead for probably 25 years. Is that? Okay. Um, but he's S.M., I learned as I was listening, his name is Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. I mean, it's, he's, Google this, go home tonight and Google it and find Esrim Lockridge's sermon called Amen or That's My King. And at the end of it, it's about an hour long, at least the one I listened to, but at the end of it, he's, he's preaching on the Lord's Prayer and the word Amen. He's getting... It's all about the amen. It goes through the whole, and it's such a, it's only blacks can preach this way. I don't know if that sounds, but it will make a shouting Methodist out of you. It'll, uh, he had that whole room on their feet in glory. But uh, my king, and he just goes on and on talking about who his king is. And do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? And uh, he gets to the end and he puts the, the amen on it. I don't think, and, and, yeah, I, I won't read it right. I won't read it right. But I, went, I didn't know where to stop in writing it, Mike, so I just started copying the whole thing. But Google that, and uh, I promise you, you won't, be, you won't waste your time in doing it. And, uh, and if somebody's got a good website for where maybe just the end portion is, if you'll Google it to me, I'll try to Google it to everybody or email it to everybody. But uh, it'll warm your heart. It'll warm your heart. And, he, and the whole point is, amen.
And if you can't say amen, Revelation would say your place is the lake of fire. That's what the lake of fire is for, is those who don't know how to say amen. Anyway, I, uh, I, I wanted to read it, but I, I don't think I'm going to try because I'll, I'll underperform. Mike. There's one thing that Mark says in his sermon that just really speaks in my heart. Um, when I sit in a lot of churches today, he says, if you think you can distract the God called preacher by saying amen, yeah. try it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we just sit back so often and, you know, afraid to. I don't know who he was preaching to. My impression was he was preaching to white folks. In, in the, I wonder if it was Moody. But it is, a, it is a priceless sermon. And it's on King Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. And it's really about amen. And he had, it, it was, it's glorious. Okay, I'm going to pray. Um, Lord, what we need tonight, and we needed tonight, was to move from teaching to preaching because we can't just teach the book of Revelation. It needs to be shouted. It needs to be proclaimed and preached. And we know there's a place for teaching and there's a place for preaching. But thank you tonight that you've moved us with your last word. And what more can you say than to us you have said? And Lord, we thank you for your complete word that there's nothing to take away and nothing to add. And we thank you that your word ultimately is your son. In him, it is always yes. And so, Lord, to your yes, we respond with our yes. Amen. So be it. We affirm who you are and what you've done. And all of our being just shouts, Lord, the amen. So be it. Be Lord, be king, be ruler over all. And let us join with the prayers of the historic church. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And send us out into the world as your bride, inviting sinners to come, all who are thirsty. Come. The doors are still open. Come. Thank you for speaking to us. Use your word in each of our hearts to transform us so that we can be a part of your transformation in the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's all say it. Amen. Amen.